Okay. Welcome to the Cavallo Classroom, Lesson 7. I'm Paul Joseph Rovelli, uh, Director of the Gnostic Church of Light. And today, our lesson is going to be the first part of two parts on the Zohar. We're going to start a little bit more in a historical context today, and we'll get to some very fascinating specifics next time uh, on uh, the nature of the Shekinah and um, what that means in terms of the Scarlet Woman of Thelema. But first, I think it's important for us to understand the Zohar in its uh, fuller historical context. And it is not, a, while it in itself is exclusively a Jewish document, uh, it is not, it points to something that is not only Jewish, but also takes the Hermetic line at the same time. Uh, there was great interaction at uh, some point. Uh, it is no wonder that something like the Zohar uh, has a, a, a mythos about it, a, an historical story that points to its origins and puts that in um, a, a, an uncertain light. Uh, because the Zohar really grew out of a mystical tradition uh, that I think eventually came to a point where it was to be codified. Uh, the Zohar itself as a word means uh, splendor or radiance. So we are talking about the mystical light and what the Hebrew culture was uh, creating in its understanding of this light. So we start with the Zohar being a poem of Moses de Leon. He was a Spanish Kabbalist uh, you know, in the 13th century. So that's approximately uh, 1,200 uh, of the, in the Common Era. And uh, he, in this poem, he sings of lights and sparks, uh, the sun, the moon, the unending love between the celestial bridegroom and his bride. And that, again, is a teaser for what we'll be doing in the second part of uh, this lesson. Um, and then, of course, in Liberal, we know that, you know, we have the quote for he is ever a son and she a moon. So we see, uh, and we will see more and more how Crowley came to understand the Zohar and to incorporate that into uh, what would go through his mind in his connection to the brighter communication known as the Book of the Law. Okay, uh, Moses de Leon claimed that... Uh, this was the work of a Rabbi Shimon from the second century, a teacher who spent uh, 12 years secluded in a cave. And, and of course, then after his death, this was handed down orally for uh, what would be a thousand years uh, by the time Moses de Leon comes on the scene. But um, essentially, Moses de Leon is really surrendering his identity to uh, this character, Rabbi Shimon, and... Uh, what makes that really fascinating is it reduced for him the burden of self-consciousness in writing this poem. He didn't have to take certain strictures or deal with certain taboos uh, or what have you, or just limitations of the personal ego to, to really do this. And it left him a chance for him to plumb the depths of his soul uh, you know, and soar to timeless dimensions. Uh, so really, this is, the Zohar becomes a recording of his own ecstasy. You know, his own mystical ecstasy is, is what produces this. So if you want, you can say this is class AB, not just a preternatural intelligence, but a, um, you know, a, a, a something written in, in, in uh, profound inspiration, which is class B. Um, and essentially, uh, what Moses de Leon is doing is uh, creating a mystical commentary on the Torah. Okay, uh, you could say this was an, an inner midrash, um, you know, uh, which would be a literal interpretation, you know, uh, of the law based on the Torah. And Torah is a word that actually means law. Uh, but his lie about its antiquity does meet with some controversy within Jewish culture. Uh, 
it probably wasn't entirely a creation of Moses de Leon, and he created this character. Um, and so the Zohar itself, I think, uh, was anathema to, uh, and, and heterodox to uh, Hebrew culture and its traditional interpretation of the Torah. And this, that means really that it took some time, because in my note here I see that, uh, you know, 1490 and 1540 became times when, uh, you know, uh, European uh, Jews were, you know, able to talk about this openly for the first time. Uh, and uh, it led to other prophecies uh, that when studied, uh, this would uh, lead to the coming of the King Messiah. <coughs> Now, it, the, we're in the heat of the Renaissance at the same time, and Pico di Mirandola really takes up with uh, the Kabbalah and the Zohar at the end of the 15th century. Uh, and through that, you know, your, your hermetic uh, Christian Kabbalah would, uh, you know, come into shape. And, and those are kind of two parts of, of a whole, really, hermetic Christian Kabbalah. Um, I think that uh, we we still can look at this as a prior natural connection. There was some evidence of automatic writing in the stories. Uh, the there there was a connection uh, with uh, Moses de Leon had with Joseph Abalafia. Uh, however. The, the focus of the Zohar is, uh, you know, the, the theosophical or, or theological discussion of the Sephirot, the manifestations of the Ein Sof and its mystical attrib attributes. Uh, essentially, as the Kabbalah teaches, God is ineffable, but the Sephirot provide a way to know the unknowable. And... God comprises then essentially the divine androgyne, uh, their romantic and sexual relationship, the uh, divine uh, couple, Tifereth and Shekinah. And we talked a good bit about that in uh, one of our earlier lessons when we talked about the book of the Concealed Mystery and how Hachma and Bina through Da'ath uh, create the sun vow in Tifereth and the Hachman Bina being the I and H of the Tetragrammaton, the vow becomes the, the V of the Tetragrammaton in Tifereth. Where the Shekinah is hidden, she ultimately would descend into Malkuth as the daughter of Bina and the sister of uh, Val or uh, the sister of Tifereth. And we have the playing out of the court cards as we discussed in that lesson. Uh, so this is not a... Um, this is not some kind of veiled uh, perversion. You know, it, it can be read in the wrong way, I think. Uh, the essential work of the Zohar really is to expand the Torah daily to create your own mystical commentary. And, and this is the key to all Kabbal Kabbalistic work. So whether it's the Zohar or uh, the holy books of Thelema, or you know other uh, prophetic works that people have attempted over time, some to greater and lesser degree uh, of quality. Um, we know that it is up to us in our generation consistently to make contact with the divine, and so study of these kinds of works uh, helps us to understand our history and helps us to understand how to comport ourselves in our own pursuit of prior natural contact. Uh, the Zohar teaches that, you know, God is hidden and revealed in the Torah. Such the class A commentary in holy books changed not so much as the style of a letter because in that is the divine manifestation and you're not going to make a fix to that. So God is essentially said to be hidden in the Torah because the Torah is not God's name. He's revealed because the Torah expresses God's will and God's being. So the Torah really is essentially a living document. Uh, God can only be 
uh, known then uh, and grasped to the degree that one opens the gates of imagination. In the Zohar, the Sephiroth are, are avoided in that context. These emanations instead are called lights, uh, levels, links, roots, garments of the king, crowns of the king, and, and there's dozens of other images. Uh, the reader really needs to interpret the symbolism and identify the car, corresponding sephira when going through some of the symbolism in the Zohar. Uh, it's worth pointing out even at this point that uh, for some, you know, the Zohar becomes on one level an actual document, this poem that we're talking about. And the Zohar, on another level, is, is a collection of books of the Kabbalah. And that can lead to some confusion, because some people can think, you know, can say the Zohar, and they're referring specifically to a book, and, an, and another person can say the Zohar, and they're linking to a set of books. And uh, that, that confusion, you know, should be noted, so that right now we're talking about really one specific work, and we're going to get into that. We're not covering all the other books of, of the Kabbalah. Uh, the system of the Zohar and the Sephiroth is uh, mythological. Thus, the Sephiroth are often pictured in the form of the Adam Kadmon, or as a cosmic tree growing downwards from its roots above. Um, this represents really our archetypal nature, this Adam Kadmon. And we've discussed this a good bit both in some of the uh, Kabbalistic course and uh, in, in some recent church sermons here as well, uh, the Adam Kadmon is that archetypal um, uh, image of God starting to take on substance, the divine starting to take on substance that would ultimately create the hologram for the human race. And, and we come out of that male and female from that androgyne, that divine androgyne, that androgynous substance that we call the divine. Uh, from above to below, the Sephiroth enact the drama of emanation, of the transition from the Ein Soft to creation. And the Adam Kadmon again is that key. Okay. Um, it really is the one becoming the all. And uh, this fracturing of being is that which would seek to restore itself to individuation. So there's a process in the divine emanation. Kether turns downward towards manifestation, manifestation and is called, and I may pronounce some of these Hebrew words wrong, is called raison or will and is known as the Ein Sof Hour, where no difference is made. Something very important to Nui in the Book of the Law. Hachma then, from Kether, Hachma becomes the first primordial point. Its wisdom shines forth and is called the beginning because Kether has no beginning. Kether is still really as much a part of the Ein Sof Hour as it is the hour of the Ein Sof Hour, even as much as it is Kether of the Tree of Life. Okay, this point then that is Hakma, you know, expands into a circle and it is called Bina. So we have the I now in the H of the Tetragrammaton, Bina, of course, being understanding. Um, and so it has become the womb of the Divine Mother. She receives the seed that is the point of Hakma and conceives the uh, lower seven Sephiroth. She is called the totality of all individuation. We can see why the new ego structure of the master of the temple is attained here. Okay, She's called the world that is coming, constantly coming and flowing. The mystical formula, change equals stability, applies. These three sephiroth, these supernals, Kether, Hachman, Bina then, are the head of the Adam Kadmon. So we're creating this large holographic image uh, superimposed over the tree of life, shall we say. And that, that's an astounding symbol the more you begin to think about it. Okay? And again, the totality of all individuation. Okay? Uh, the ego structure of the master of the temple is in that 
the self is given for the all. That's part of what it is. The, you know, it is it is a grade of service. Most people don't really reach master of the temple because of the level of service uh, that you know is, is really created in that office by any individual having that attainment. A lot of people claim it just to claim authority. It is not about authority at all. It is about uh, service to the race. Um, so, Bina gives birth uh, first to uh, Hesed and Gabura, you know, the, the right and left arms of the Adam Kabmon and the two sides of the divine personality. Uh, these two archetypes are necessary for the world to function. Um, their balance would be achieved in Tifereth, also called Rabbanim or Compassion. Again, I may be mispronouncing the uh, Jewish word. Um, it is uh, the imbalance, though, that uh, generates the Sitra Abra, uh, the other side, and that is depicted in the symbol of a serpent. Okay, um, Tifereth becomes the trunk of the body of the Adam Kadmon, and thus we have the concept of heaven and the sun king, you know, and that blessed holy one. Why Libra 65 and Al? praises Adonai. This is Adonai in, in, the, in the Thelemic concept and what Bible 65 is all about. Okay, so we're now to the son of Hachma and Bina, uh, which really is Tifereth. Okay, um, the Shekinah is then the divine presence in Malkuth. We complete the Tetragrammaton in its own way. However, from Tifereth, Netzek, and Hadar emanated next. They are the left and right legs of the Adam Kadmon and the source of prophecy. Note that they're connected by Pei, uh, the mouth, which is the connecting link. And for those familiar with the formula of On in Thelema, uh, this is uh, you know the important point where uh, the uh, uh, where the uh, Adam Kadmon begins to re-coalesce in, in, in the magic of the syzygy. Uh, Yasad is next. It represents the phallus. It is the axis mundi, and all the other sephiroth are channeled through Yasad. Uh, it is also called Zadik, the righteous one, and the fountain of the world. The Shekinah is the daughter of Bina and the bride of the Tiferet. Now, the Hebrews, in, in a lot of texts, deal with the Shekinah as a divine grace that falls on a community, and the community must act in accord. Uh, in Thelemic terms, our Kabbalah really looks at the individual, and the Shekinah is the blessing of the divine upon the individual. Uh, so that it is the, that inspiration that leads us forward. In the same way that it, we uh, understand the goddess has to have inspired the Ein Sof hour to emanation, that it might come to know itself. So then the Shekinah is that blessing of the divine upon each of us individually, that we may come to know ourselves and attain to that Asar Un Nefer, individuation. You know, and... You know, this in accord with the principle established in Liberal. I am divided for love's sake, for the chance of union. Okay, so that we each become then a, a part of a syzygy, a union of the divine couple. This is as much an inward expression of the anima and animus, as Jung might call in each of us, or, or this may be achieved through uh, sexual magic, as uh, some would approach this. And, uh, you know, there's probably as many ways as there are... Uh, ideas on uh, the Zohar. So uh, we, we, we hesitate to say that there's any official way to do this, okay? Um, indeed, the stimulation of Yasad, you know, brings about that union. Uh, it, it, that stimulation comes from an imbalance. And again, we said the imbalance is the serpent. You know, it injects a venom into the Shekinah. This is the aspiration to, uh, uh, to enlightenment, to attain. Okay? Um, and so our, our opening entry into the divine is through the Shekinah. Okay, um, and the, the tree of life itself really becomes a map of consciousness. Okay, so uh, 
if we were to go back a little bit and, and, and start to look at the Torah as a parable, as opposed to, uh, you know, those who read it uh, fundamentally, exactly, by, you know, literally. Um, as a parable, Israel is below and the angels are above. So the angels, uh, when they descend, they put on garments of this world. And the Torah does the same thing. as it, it is, you know, the divine, and it comes on in the garment of this world in the shape of a book with letters. And, you know, again, another aspect of uh, the books of the Kabbalah, how important the letters are mystically to the formation of the universe. Again, sticking within a strictly Hebrew context, you know, in that light. Um, so, uh, the Torah then is a living document, okay, in the same way that Liber Al, our book of the law, is a living document. Um, of course, the Kabbalah builds itself on the symbolism of Genesis, and we cannot, as Thelemites, escape that. It must be a part of our Kabbalah as well. So, uh, the question is, can we, uh, understand the Torah in through the mysticism of the Zohar in such a way as to show that our uh, Thelemic Kabbalah is something of value. And we'll see, especially in, in the second half of this lesson, how that is true. Uh, the, in Genesis, Genesis 1-1, with beginning, created Elohim. So the concealed one who is not known created the palace, called Elohim. The enlightened will shine like the Zohar of the sky, and those who make the masses righteous will shine like the stars forever and ever. And that's out of Daniel. Okay? And we say the masses are the petty egos of the self, you know, not the masses of our, our, our humanity. Okay? The master of the temple casts his or her star into the heavens. This is that idea. Okay? Um, connecting with the masses of people on another level, affecting the um, archetypes that shape uh, the thinking of human culture. Uh, the light uh, created by the Blessed and the Holy One in the act of creation uh, uh, flared from one end of the world to the other, but was hidden from the wicked and sown like a seed that it might feed the world and renew every day the act of creation. This uh, being a statement of the Zohar. And, you know, we just have to turn around and say the wicked are just the people not paying attention, the sleepers. Uh, other than that, as we study the, the radiance of the holy books, we do see the act of creation in each moment. Today is the only day. Now is the only moment we have. And so the whole of the universe is being created in this moment. Um and of course, the Adam Kadmon, male and female, that Andrew join, is the mystery by which heaven and earth are created. And, you know, a human being is called Adam. Adam simply means, uh, you know, uh, humanity. It's another word for humanity. And, you know, and the word means male and female are one. Any image that does not brace the man, male and the female is not a high and true image. So we see in images of the Adam Kadmon through various uh, Zoharic and uh, Kabbalistic texts, uh, even the images of alchemy, where we're constantly seeing a man and woman laid out in the process of coagula and, uh, and um, salve. So we get to the Hebrew Abram, who becomes the father of, uh, you know, in a sense, the human race. Uh, Ab if, of the Ab of Abram or Abram uh, means father, and the Ram means high. So it's the, the father on high. Um, Noted though the male and the female are together. So in IHVH we see that, and um, Abram then you know is is essentially a her in that sentence called soul breath and sends from the palace of holiness uh, to the land uh, he will show her so we have this process of okay I've said that in a kind of confusing way so let me straighten that up a little bit in in the Tetragrammaton as we see in the um, in the book of the concealed mystery you know the I and the H 
uh, mating, so to speak, to create the, the, the V and, and the H final. And that soul is centered with, you know, the, the, the high father, that's the light descending from Kether, Hab Abram, into Val. Okay? And Val has hidden within it the Shekinah. So therefore the soul becomes, uh, the, the H final becomes the soul breath. You know, uh, of the, you know of of that of those sephirot that surround Tifereth on the tree of life, and uh, this soul she has been sent from the palace of holiness t uh, to the land that the All Father uh, Kether will show her the manifestation of the looks, and he sends her brother in in the in the Hebrew story he sends her brother Lot, uh, who was the uh, who was the cursed serpent which is hot eaten and. Uh, Thelema, and he's the divisor of evil, which is individuation, pulling uh, apart from the herd, okay, and it is this serpent that seduces Eve in the Garden of Eden, so we're seeing that, you know, are they really being tricked into manifestation, or is this just simply a divine process, and if we don't read the story so literally, but allegorically, we see a necessary process. There's too many logical holes in this. What like God couldn't tell that the serpent was going to show up in the garden, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the, we um, we see that there's a hidden story behind Genesis. The parable taken literally can be easily misconstrued, but for those who have ears, even in the Old Testament, Jacob. Uh, with his struggles with the divine, uh, is later renamed Israel, which you know basically means you know uh, he you know he who struggles with with God. So the uh, in the story of Jacob, uh, later of being called Israel, first he attained the end of thought, the elucidation of the written Torah. She. She, the, the female aspect of this, is the oral Torah, called bear. And, and again, I may be, be mispronouncing that word, but she is a bear, a well, and an explanation of the one who is called Shiva, seven. Shiva is the mighty voice, while at the end is, at the, or at the end of thought, is bear Shiva. So, bear Shiva is the seven Sephiroth, the daughter or the soul you know, she again, that is the soul breath that is created in the Ruach on the tree of life. So, Jacob would leave the Beersheba, the, the secret of the mystery of faith, and set out uh, for Haran, as it is said in, in the Old Testament. Um, the, this is the side of the woman of whoredom, the adulteress. And you know, we can say that, you know, from this, we, we begin the story of Nuit, where, who is seeking certainty, not faith while in life. So he's setting out on a journey. He's leaving this end of thought, the Beersheba, and um, looking for something beyond, uh, you know, what, what, what is the mystery of faith in the divine? And he sets out for Haran, and, and this in, in this he searches out the woman of whoredom, the adulteress. Now, this is where I'll conclude so that we can set up for the next lecture next month, and in that um, we will display the secret of secrets of the Zohar, which is perfectly encapsulated in Liber Al, uh, but not just Liber Al, most importantly in Crowley's scrying of the 30 ethers, where Babylon comes along uh, as, the, as the whore and the adulteress. And you can, you'll see how the images in Liber Al correspond perfectly with the images of the Zohar and how whatever went on in Crowley's mind, he created something uh, that uh, really updated uh, a very ancient 12th century prophecy and brought it into the 20th century and today the 21st century. So... Hopefully, uh, for those that have watched this, we've whet your appetite for uh, the next part of the lecture, uh, which will happen on the first uh, Sunday of uh, December. 
Uh, two weeks from now, we have uh, the, uh, the uh, Rosicrucian Mass here at the Church of Light. Uh, we'll, we'll hope to see some people in attendance, and we'll look forward to seeing you again online for both. And a reminder for anyone interested, we are trying to uh, organize classes around this video uh, built on a conference call as the notes will be uh, put online. So uh, until then, take care, be well.